may possibly be the most confusing the Oracle has ever been with these. And I'm no English major or English minor. In fact, I barely speak English. So I'm the son this spa. So I will try my best. The first part, at least, seems to indicate converging of time. When it talks about the well converging um, place and divisions of time. And when it mentions the almanac, and when we think about uh, wisdom and what the entire culture that Jules York was building up to represents, what comes to my mind is wisdom being timeless, such as being able to open a book and read the thoughts of someone long dead as if they were still here, all of their information, all their wisdom, you can still read. Which brings to mind Carl Sagan. And anything that reminds me of Carl Sagan is a good thing in my book. So, to sum this one up, my best guess, wisdom is timeless. Maybe. Why is the oracle even like this? The whole 12 times 30 days sounds like months. The whole 12 times night sky crosses per year sounds like the number of months in a year. And it just, maybe, I don't know. But I think it's a really convoluted way of saying time passes and no matter how much time passes, the wisdom will never decay. Well, that's the toughest puzzles coming up. No, not that one. In fact, you're going to be wishing you could go back to that one. No, not that one either. That's the one. The most frustrating puzzle ever. Of all time. Alright, I feel like this pyramid is very unstable, but I'm not too worried about it because I'm crazy, so I'm just going to crawl right under it. And I guess we're still crawling. Alright, let's see what we have here. We appear to have the values 0 through 9, unhelpfully represented as just a series of notches on stone. I can move them and, and knock them around, and they appear to be replicated on the other side as well. So 0 through 9, 2 versions of each digit. Only values multiplied or divided by 7 are rewarded here. That is actually really, really useful. We must need to build numbers that are multiples of 7, like 7, 14, 21, 28, you know, the multiples that everyone has problems with. And we must need to build them in that main center area. Though notches carved on bricks once meant mean values beyond these gates. The counters here depend upon place for what number they indicate. Only the Pandita of the Seventh Mountain will know these be not sums. And we have the name drop for the puzzle. So how is a number formed? Uh, let's take this six over here and place it at the top here. Um, nothing interesting happens, okay? Let's put a seven there. Okay, those sides lock blue to show that one digit row seven is divisible by seven. Eight will not work, um, so seven is divisible by seven. Are there any other digits? I mean, zero is kind of special. Well, actually, zero does work, so yay. Okay, so this is a row and a column. So question time. Is it all the numbers in the row added up, multiplied, probably not subtracted, or whatever that would create this, the digit? So right here we have six plus one. That should be seven, but that's not locking. So clearly, addition is not working here. Maybe instead of addition, it just literally means the number form from left to right. I just put 1 and 4 there. 1 and 4 together is 14. Switch them around, 41 doesn't work. 
because 41 is not divisible by 7, 14 is. So now we know left to right, what about up to down? All right, so 14 would work, 41 wouldn't. And since 14 is working now, we know that the numbers are read from up to down and not from down to up. All right, so columns are from up to down and rows are from left to right. Okay, so now we understand the puzzle. The challenge will be that the numbers will have to build off of each other like some numerical crossword puzzle where each row and column can be any number of different valid solutions. There are many, 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 many configurations this puzzle can take, and we may have to backtrack if we cannot build any more seven divisible numbers with the parts that we have when we reach near the end. So, we have to consider our approach to this puzzle. We need to figure out how to approach this puzzle in a way that maximizes our chances of landing on a solution. I am going to assume given how open-ended this puzzle is, that there are many more than just one solution. For each additional digit we add, we decrease the chance that the subset of the puzzle we have now is part of at least one of those many solutions. For instance, we added a 7 at the top. Any solutions part of the puzzle that do not have a 7 at the top, for instance, 0, the only other possible option we can put there, are now unavailable to us. Now we place 14 in this row. Any solutions of the puzzle that do not have a 7 and 14 in those places are now unavailable to us. Therefore, the number of possible solutions decreases exponentially. So what can we do to maximize our chances that, per each move, we are at least on some solution path? You may have heard it said, do the hardest thing first. Getting that out of the way would allow you to focus on the easier ones. It's not bad advice, generally speaking. In this particular case, that would mean solving the seven-digit one in the middle first. No. The problem is that there are a lot of numbers divisible by seven that have seven digits. With one digit, you have two possibilities. With two digits, you have 13 possibilities, although because we can start a double digit with zero, we technically have double O and 07, which would make 15. With three digits, you would have them that much more. You start at the first three-digit number divisible by 7, 105, and then you add 7, then again, then again, until you pass 999. And with four digits, well, you get the picture. Of a puzzle with likely many solutions, it is probable that a two-digit number you select will be part of a larger array of solutions than any three-digit number. Pick a seven-digit number first. Hell, you may already be in an unwinnable situation without having to backtrack somewhere. So the idea is solve the smallest ones first. If we cannot solve any more, backtrack and choose another value in some predefined order. And if that doesn't work, continue backtracking a bit further and exhausting your possibilities. Computers are built for this sort of thing. So where do we start? Well, the top is a good place as any one digit. I have drawn the following diagram showing the order in which I will solve the squares. So obviously we start at the top, then we go to the sides as explained earlier because they're just two digit areas. Then the uh, three digit columns because they already have a locked uh, last digit so that there's less of a pool to choose from. Then the three digit value at the top, we have to pull that out of whatever digits we have remaining since there's no first or last digit lock from another solution. And then we have the two three digit values on the sides. And then finally, we solve the last two. Now, not only is this a great order to approach the puzzle in, maximizing your chances of getting on a good solution, it may also look familiar to some, or to one person. Now, I'm not going to name any names. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to. I've never done this before. But let's just say Paul Knight kind of guy. When I did research for this puzzle, I found that someone really, really, really wanted to solve the hell out of it. I 
I linked Paul's blog in the description. But basically, he built a C program that solved in a brute force way, but using this order, and got a solution rather quickly. I adapted said program into Python because I wanted to play with it a little more, uh, which I will get into a little bit later. I have some statistical analysis I did based on this approach versus the approach where you solve the hardest one first, and it really shows the difference. <laughs> But we will look at that after I've gone over the rest of this approach. So this approach emphasizes solving smaller ones first, giving the higher chance of being in a valid solution that we already discussed. This also emphasizes solving ones that are a mix between being small and already being partially solved. When a digit is locked, so to speak, due to another solution, it limits your choices, allowing you to more easily pick and choose a number that works. Less choices is good. It means backtracking isn't as annoying. You burn through all your options faster. And finally, you will never have to decide on a divisible by seven number with more than three digits. That's a big one. By solving in this order, the four digit one from the top, the five and seven digit ones on the row are all solved by solving the last two squares. Remember, when doing the sides, you are only focusing on numbers with three digits going down divisible by seven. And as humans, we hate math. Well, most of us anyway. You have only two squares to fill in, and you have a puzzle that so helpfully marks rows and columns in blue if they are divisible by seven. So use that. Screw the bloody calculator to stick them in and see if they work. If not, stick them in the other way. If not, backtrack and try again. Not saying you won't ever use a calculator. I normally, when calculating three digit numbers with the first digit locked, find the lowest number I can make with the digits that is divisible by seven. Then I keep adding seven to that to burn through possibilities. My personal view is I pencil and paper up to the 12th square, then let the puzzle do my math for me using only paper to write down what choices I've made, since I am most likely gonna be backtracking a lot with that three digit row and two three digit columns there. But there's a problem with this. Everything I've shown so far is, is sound. In fact, let's move over to the statistical analysis. Here, what I've done is I've adapted that program I discussed earlier into Python, ran it through 10,000 times, and had it calculate two values. One, how many times this program had to backtrack to find a solution. And two, what is the furthest it had to backtrack? So each run has a unique path to get to some solution. And if it can't make any more solutions, it reaches the end, there's nothing to do, then it backtracks, and then that counts against it. What we're looking for is a low number of backtracking. So the less you had to backtrack, the easier it would be for the human, because for us, backtracking is probably the most annoying thing. So, what does this all mean? Well, the results aren't the best. All these 10,000 results put together form an average of about 1,600 backtrackings. That means on average, if you take that approach, you, are, you might have to backtrack a good deal, a great number of times to find a number that's going to work and then eventually lead to a solution. Now, that average doesn't tell you much. It te but for example, you can have the numbers one through 10, or you can have the numbers, you know, a bunch of negative numbers, a bunch of high positive numbers, and yet they'd have the same average. It doesn't tell you how spaced out the numbers are. Um, if you're familiar with statistics, I'm actually not very familiar with statistics myself, but if you, if you are, there's a concept called standard deviation, and that kind of gives you a feel for what the standard is for how far away number, uh, numbers are from the average. Uh, a low standard deviation would mean that very small range. The standard deviation that I calculated for this, or LibreOffice calculated, was 3,579. <sighs> the problem is there's so much variation. You can get lucky and you can have a great run, like only ever having to backtrack to the, the 13th um, 
location, which that mean, I mean the um, if you look at the tiles in the order you should solve them in, only back to there and solve it in with a total of 30 backtrackings or you might have to go all the way down to the 8th uh, location and end up solving with 2,210 backtrackings. Or you can get even more unlucky. In fact, the uh, maximum I calculated was 31,118 backtrackings for a particularly very bad run of the puzzle. And this is why I either A, feel that I am missing a better way to approach this, which also explains why this video took a very long time to make, and two, or two I should say, this puzzle sucks. Erica, this isn't a review! Shut up, Twilight. Now, the problem is, even if, it, with all these numbers, with all these calculations, with all this work that, I, that I've done, it looks like the best approach to this puzzle is only marginally is only marginally good. To compare, these 10,000 values took around 10 to 15 minutes for my Python program to calculate. I had to cut down the number of runs to only 10, and it still took over an hour to run. And if, I'm not even going to give any average of any numbers because there's only 10 data points, and just looking at these numbers, you can see how bad they are. There, every single one of them is above a, in the hundred thousands range. And you see that, that really bad number there? Yeah, um, that's 190 million. That set of statistics, that set of runs, that number of backtrackings happens if you try to solve the hardest first. So there is a discreetly and hugely beneficial um, time saver to solving the easier ones first. The statistics show it, but they still are not the best. They still show that you're going to be spending a lot of time working on something, especially if you don't get that lucky, and there isn't really much I can figure out that you can do about it. The only, the only way I found was a program to do it for me. Maybe there exists a better way. Probably not that way. But maybe there exists a better way somewhere. And I feel that there has to be some better way to approach this. This is simply the best I can do. Um, which is kind of sad because this is the penultimate puzzle. It's probably the hardest puzzle in the game. So, I know you don't want to watch me run through this manually because that would be incredibly boring. I've said what I wanted to say. I've shown what I wanted to show. The point is the approach I detailed is has a chance of getting you a solution within a reasonable time frame. But in honor of the fact that Paul Knight found that the official strategy guide was wrong because it failed to take into account that the top uh, value could be zero or that um, a two uh, or that another um, that a row or column could start with a zero and therefore the official strategy guide was way woefully inaccurate in regarding the number of possible solutions to this puzzle so in honor of that I am going to use the solution that his program and by extension mine when I have it run um, choosing tiles 0 through 9, choosing digits 0 through 9 with no randomization, I'm going to choose the first solution that that program created because my mind worked the same way and by some stroke of luck that ended up being a very simple, uh, there wasn't many backtracking to get that solution and yeah, so here it is.
anyone has anything else that they can add to this, I greatly appreciate it. This puzzle, more than any other puzzle, even assembly of the planners, I would really like feedback from because I can't shake the feeling there has to be a better way to solve this. So, having tackled the toughest puzzle in the game in terms of endurance, I personally consider the turning of the Diva Sa to be the true toughest puzzle in my favorite overall, we finish out our penultimate puzzle. So what is next? Do you remember all the pieces we found of the Hasuna? Do you remember a long time ago before I jumped into parody of Jalam, you know, the irrigation puzzle? I found a puzzle that was unique and being unsolvable until you found other pieces in other puzzles. We will return there, bring harmony to the Hasuna, and with that, start our last ride of the day and finish this game once and for all. The tasks resolved so far marked here are 23. So many changes to this countryside, from seeds to stones, all in their order due. None less than this ambitious city fair are all accounted by our engineers. Count among them those who control the fields, as well as tend and measure them. With skills and visions both of mind and eye, these members fill the house of Kazalam. 